Ting Ting Wang is a senior research scientist at NVIDIA. Uh, he's worked on the Gaogan project, the app for which he won Best in Show Award and the Audience Choice Award at Segref Real Time Live 2019. His research interests include computer vision, machine learning, and computer graphics, particularly where all three of those intersect. His recent research focus is on using generative adversarial models to synthesize realistic images and videos with applications to rendering, visual manipulations, and beyond. So Ting Chung, welcome, and over to you. Okay. Okay, uh, so thanks Rob for the introduction and uh, thanks everyone for joining today. So today I'm gonna present Gaugen image synthesis using Spade. So I want to start a talk by giving a simplified view of computer graphics. Thank so in this thing. simplified view- One uh, super quick thing, um, the view you're sharing is the presenter view. Uh, if you do wanna switch that, we see your slide, but just in case you wanted to switch it. Uh, so how do I Let me try it again? Mm. It's okay, we were able to see the slide. So if that's if that's what you have to share with them, it's very visible still. Okay, then maybe I'll just share this again. Uh, let me try. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I want to um, basically start a talk with a simplified view of computer graphics. So in this view, um, computer graphics consists of three um, different steps. So the first is authoring. So you start with a very simple concept, say like a rabbit, and then you can create a 3D assets of this concept. So typically you can use like uh, professional tools like Maya to build this concept. And the second a component is scene representation. So you have built a, a bunch of CAD models and then to create an interesting scene, you'll need to put them all together. So typically we can use like a scene graph to do this where different nodes of a scene graph represents different objects and uh, the arrows represent the relationships between them. And finally, the third component is the rendering part, which converts this scene graph to a real image. So during this part, we need to consider things like the visibility of the objects, the shadings, etc., to render a realistic image. So recently there's a trend called neural computer graphics. So it's about using neural networks to make computer graphics look better. The neural networks can be used to improve each component in this uh, simplified pipeline. It can be used to uh, aid the authoring part to create better 3D assets. For example, uh, the recent Python HD method can use can be used to create realistic and uh, very detailed 3D human meshes by just looking at a single 2D image as shown on the left. Next, there are also efforts in using neural networks to describe different objects and their relationships in a scene. For example, the um, neural scene representation work by DeepMind, they use the output from the encoder to represent the relationships between different objects in the scene. And finally, there's a rendering part where there are um, 
many works trying to convert scene representations to an image. And the advantage is that um, using this, you can bypass the tedious visibility and the shading components in the traditional graphics pipeline. You just need to apply a neural network to do this job. Okay, so in this talk, uh, I'll just mainly focus on the neural rendering part, the last component in the pipeline. So there are roughly two different ways to do this neural rendering. One is 2D to 2D, and the other is 2D to 2D. So the 3D to 2D one, it starts with some scene representation and uh, directly use the geometry and feed into the network to generate the output image. So for the 2D to 2D one, you first project the um, 3D representation to uh, an intermediate 2D representation. For example, uh, here we have a 2D semantic representation of the bunny where different colors represent different body parts of the object. And then given this 2D map, we can feed it to a neural network to generate the final image. Okay, so um, this uh, 2D to 2D mapping can also be a uh, code image or video domain transfer. We have uh, input semantic representation and then we use the neural network to render the uh, output image. This can also be called a semantic image synthesis. So given a 2D semantic image as shown on the left, the neural network uh, or a generator will synthesize the images as shown on the right. So here you can see that different colors represent different uh, categories. For example, the green represents the trees or the plants, and then um, gray represents the clouds, etc. Okay, so actually we've built an app uh, for this um, image translation. So next we're gonna watch a short video demonstrating the potential of this app. Let's try and darken that up a bit with some cloud. Oh, that's wonderful. What if we were to change all that to, to rock? Okay, this could become rock, and then we gotta replace the mountain. Let's try waterfall just by pulling water down from the top there. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? This technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is gonna be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. The input to this model is something we call a segmentation map. It's like a coloring book picture that describes, here's where a tree is, here's where the sky is, here's where the ground is, and it doesn't have any details. And then the neural network is able to fill in all the texture and shadows and the colors based on things that it's learned from a large database of real world images. I would like to see that tree reflecting in that pond. The real advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to in the past. I really think this technology is gonna be great for the dreamers of the world. Okay, so this is the uh, Gaugen demo that we've just seen in the video. And it's still running at this website here, uh, this URL. So in case you're interested, uh, you can go ahead and give it a try yourself. 
So the interface of the app is like this. So on the left hand side, you can see all the um, different categories that you can choose from. And then um, in the middle is the canvas that you can draw. You can choose your brush shape and your brush size. And you can also fill in different regions. And then after you click the convert button, um, the output image should show on the right, as shown here. Uh, in case you are not satisfied with this image, you can also steal the styles from different images on the bottom here. So if you want to, uh, your image to look more reddish or bluish, uh, you can um, steal the styles from these example images. Okay, so since we released this app online, uh, it has been used by many different people. So these are the images uh, created by different people using this Galgen app and uh, share them on the social media. So you can see that they are all beautifully rendered uh, landscape images. Okay, so in addition to synthesized images just for fun, uh, Galgen actually also finds use in professional artists as well. So it can be used by movie directors or game producers to visualize concepts. For example, on the left hand side here, uh, this image was actually created by uh, an artist who designs the spaceship for Star Wars movies. So he wants his spaceship to sit on some um, cool background. So he used the Gauguin app to uh, synthesize this beautiful image as the background for his spaceship. So this is uh, an example showing that this app can really be useful for artists as well. Okay, so that's enough for the intro and the different use cases for Gauguin. Now let's see uh, how it works in more details. So previously, the state of art for image semantic image synthesis is piece to piece HD. So you adopt an encoder decoder design of the um, generator, which consists of a bunch of different uh, residual networks. And it works pretty nicely on highly constrained things like streets, where the bottom of the street, uh, the bottom of the image is just some road. And on the sides, there are buildings or um, trees. So one thing to notice is that um, in the residual blocks, there are many batch norms or instance norms in the generator. Okay, so here's the example showing the input schematic map and the synthesized results using piece of BHD. And as you can see, um, the objects are pretty reasonably rendered in this thing. However, when we apply P2PHD to more diverse things like the Cocoa data set, which consists of um, many more different object categories, the, perform the performance drops significantly. So this data set has more um, object categories and the layouts are usually more diverse than the street things that we've just seen. So this method really struggles to synthesize reasonable results. So after some exploring, we found that um, the table actually lies in the batch normalization process. So batch norm is a very useful operation in stabilizing the training process and uh, helps the generator achieve better results. It has been used in many different neural networks today. So the idea is that uh, after uh, convolution, we'll first normalize the activations by subtracting the mean and uh, dividing by the variance of the activation. So the mean and the sigma here are the mean and variance. By doing this, we can achieve a zero mean and a univariance um, output. And after the normalization, uh, the network also learned two parameters, gamma and beta, 
to scale and uh, add bias to the activations. So this can be seen as the inverse process of normalization. So we often call it denormalization. So after some exploring, we found that uh, this actually um, tends to wash away semantic information. So now, let, now let's look at an example here. So suppose we have two semantic maps, sky and grass, and uh, their semantic label is uh, one and five respect, respectively. So after convolution, um, we reach uh, two different numbers, 0.7 and uh, minus 0.9, um, say, for example. And then after the batch norm um, step, because we subtract the mean, uh, the after subtracting the mean, these two numbers will just become zero. And then after we multiply by gamma and uh, add beta, it will just be beta, no matter what the input uh, semantic map is. So no matter what input label we feed into the network, the network will always generate the same outputs. So all the uh, semantic information is gone during this batch normalization process. So here's the example results showing um, or demonstrating what uh, we just said. So when we have two plan um, inputs, sky and grass, P2P HD just generates um, like gray outputs, no matter what the input is, because it's confused by um, this batch normalization. So you might wonder uh, how often do we see a situation that the entire images have the same label? But the truth is that it's actually more often than you think, because as long as the, um, they are major portion of the image that's the same label, the issue will emerge. For example, um, in these images here, um, a large portion will just be C or trees. So the uh, P2BHD will basically struggle to synthesize reasonable results. So to fix this problem, we propose a new form of normalization. So the original batch norm looks like this. The gamma and beta values are fixed across the spatial domain and uh, they are fixed uh, in, the, in the network. Instead of doing this, uh, we propose to normalize the activations using this form. So here the gamma and beta values are spatially varying. And more importantly, they are derived from the input semantic mass. So they can store the semantic information in these two values. So even though um, during the normalization process, uh, the semantic information may be washed away, these two gamma and beta values can help to add the semantic uh, information back during this denormalization process. Okay, so we call this method state spatially adaptive denormalization, and this is how it works. So given the uh, uh, inputs, you first go through the uh, normalization step of batch norm. So basically minus the mean and the divide by the variance, which becomes a label-free uh, output. And next, uh, the semantic inputs will be used to compute the gamma and beta maps as shown here. And then they'll be used to scale and uh, shift the output from the normalization step. So now the uh, semantic information can be added back to the outputs of the network. Okay, so again, uh, this whole module, we call it SPADE specially adaptive denormalization because it's uh, specially varying and also it's adaptive, it's dependent on the input semantic map that you feed to the network. Okay, so given this uh, spade normalization, we can replace 
the original uh, batch norm in a residual block using this spade module to fill to form a new uh, spade residual block as shown here. And then by stacking these residual blocks, we can uh, build a new spade generator. So the inputs can just be some random noise that determines the style of the output. And then after this a number of residual blocks, we can reach the final output image. Okay, so here's uh, recall these results that we've seen earlier. That's showing p 2 bhd cannot uh, generate reasonable results because the semantic information is washed away. So we apply the same example using a spade generator, and you can see that now you can generate reasonable outputs uh, that correspond to the input semantic labels. Okay, so here are some examples for one to many synthesized um, process. So given the same input semantic label, we can generate diverse outputs as shown here. And here's another example. You can see that uh, we can generate diverse styles using the same um, input image. Okay, and here are some more example results that's generated by our method. Okay, so um, to conclude, image conditional GANs can play an important role in neural computer graphics, and there are many exciting new applications that we can explore. Okay, so um, this spade module, uh, the code of it has, has been released in our imaginary library. Uh, in addition to this spade, network, we also released a bunch of different image synthesis and video synthesis works in this library as well. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and try yourself. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi. That was a great talk. Um, this is one of the fields that I'm really interested in uh, because I have seen people using this online, but I've seen them use it for video and um, it doesn't work really well because it's doing frame by frame. Is there yeah. like a way to do, to do the video? Um, because I've seen yeah. you, you, you showed a video where there was snow. Yes, so um, we actually have some follow-up works that try to extend it to videos. Um, for example, the uh, um, work consistent video synthesis work that uh, we have released uh, earlier this year in ECCV. So basically the idea is that uh, we want to ensure that the temporal stability is, in, is uh, ensured so we'll actually um, try to build up the point cloud that we have synthesized so far for the previous frames and then ensure that the new frame that we try to synthesize is consistent with the point clouds that we built so far. Yeah. So these point clouds, are they like, um, are they specific points in the, in, in the, uh, the frame that they're gonna match to the next one, right? Yes, so basically, this, yeah, when you synthesize the first frame, um, it has no constraint at all, right? So just synthesize the new frame. Right. And then uh, from the subsequent frames, you try to condition on the previous frame that you've synthesized. So the way we condition so what on if, the, yeah. yeah I was ahead. gonna say, what if you scroll, yeah. what, what, if, what if you um, you pan, sorry, and you move? To a new, because the, the frame would the um the points that were that were being followed would would have moved off of the screen 
how would it continue doing this? Oh, so we'll actually apply like structural formation on the previous frame that was synthesized. So even if you move it out of the screen, um, it can still be reconstructed um, using the structural formation. So we actually showed the example in um, our work. So we basically um, go with loop uh, around the CD, I mean a synthetic CD. So basically we go like a, a, a 360 loop around it and then to re reach the original point that we started. And it's still consistent with the first frame that was synthesized. Wow, that's amazing. Now I've also seen another uh, system, uh, Segnets. Now they use 15 different categories. I think uh, Bogan uses uh, what 20? Is there like what's the what um what difference does having a different amount of categories uh, do? Oh, so in the original Coco data set, it has like 180 different categories, so 180. But Whoa. a lot of them, yeah, <laughs> it has a lot of categories. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, okay. but a lot of them are not really um that common. Um, especially wow. for like landscapes. Yeah, so it has all kinds of different categories like food, um, like um, people and uh, all, all different kinds of things. And uh, so basically you just pick uh, some of them that are um, more common and uh, more related to like a landscape generation. So, and uh, apply them on the, on the Gauguin app. So yeah, that, that's the difference. For instance, like a concept art or something, that these these um, many many different categories would come in handy. For instance, if you're doing an interior or something like, you have all of these different categories that will probably be used in a an outside scene, but you have a lot of them indoors, like fireplace, sofa, um, candlestick or something, you know, like all these little uh, details that you can you can add in, for instance, almost like an art director saying, I want this thing here, this thing here, this thing here. And uh, you, yeah, a, a lot of these categories, yeah, would be, yes. would be useful. Yes, so actually, but, um, yeah. I was going to say does does uh because you were saying that uh, I I can't remember if you you mentioned that um, the more categories you have causes it to be less accurate. Is that uh, uh, yeah. so that is one? Oh, sorry, that, that is one reason as well. Um, probably another okay. more important reason is that uh, landscape is kind of easier to draw. Um, for right. like normal yeah. colors. For, for example, if you need to draw like a, 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 a table or like a bed or something, um, it becomes like kind of harder for normal users right? compared to you know, drawing like mountains or clouds or sea, things like that. So that's why um, we released the, in, in the Gauguin app, it's just for, for landscapes, yeah. So um, can, Gauguin also do image translation. Actually, uh, uh, the the um the image that was used for for this event is actually an example of image translation using um, Google Deep Dream. So mm -hmm. does uh, Gauguin actually actually do something? Can, can it do something similar to that, or it's really just the uh, segmentation mapping? and you can put stuff in afterwards. Um, sure, I mean, I guess one way to do that would be you can get a segmentation from the input image and then you can then synthesize yeah. a new image right. using Gaudian. That, that's like a pretty straightforward way. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can apply the, you can apply like a state module that um, I've, I've explained in the talk to I think any image translation right. um, works. And uh, I think 
uh, it should also be useful. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for that talk. I mean, it was really interesting. Uh, there are some uh, questions in the Q and A, so definitely check those out and uh, answer okay. some of them.